Welcome to my talk. My name is Willem Church and I am an anthropology doctoral student at the University of Lucerne. It's a pity not to meet you all in person, but thank you so very much for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I am a political and economic anthropologist by training, not a philosopher. Uh, my doctoral research focuses on the political and economic consequences of large-scale mining in Papua New Guinea. My fieldwork uh, involved doing research in a region of Papua New Guinea where a copper gold mine is going to be constructed and studying the disputes between different groups that each claim to be the customary landowners of the land that the mine will be constructed on and trying to understand some of the consequences of this process, highly relevant issues of social ontology came to the fore, which I'm going to be discussing today. In this presentation, I'm going to provide a critique of the applications of Bruno Latour's act and network theory to extractive industries in Papua New Guinea. Latour and his ideas have become highly influential and controversial in social, social anthropology, particularly in medical anthropology, researchers working in dialogue with science and technology studies, and recently to the studies of a range of political uh, institutions in the study of extractive industries, such as corporations, ethnic groups, and legal entities. Given his prominence in the discipline, I find it important to critically evaluate how successful or helpful his accounts of the social world are. I'm going to do so by considering his model in light of the theoretical problems I faced while trying to come to terms with the social ontology of extractive industries. I'm going to start my talk by explaining why the study of mining in Papua New Guinea, seemingly remote from the concerns of this conference, forces researchers to face highly practical questions of social ontology. Then, through a dialogue um, with some examples of my fieldwork, I'm going to demonstrate what I see as some short, shortfallings, or the very least ambiguities in his approach. Um, I'll then evaluate how successful those are before turning to some alternative approaches that I think the philosophy of social ontology has offered, which I find markedly more helpful. Extractive industries in Papua New Guinea. So historically, customary landowners of the land that extractive industries such as mining, but also oil extraction are built on in the country of Papua New Guinea are represented by a single landowners association and landowner company that manages contracts for catering, security, construction, employment, and in some cases royalties that landowners uh, owe preferential access to. Thus, the three key questions regarding the political economy about that uh, about um, mining in Papua New Guinea are, who are the customary landowners, how ought they be to be represented, and who should be doing the representing. To demonstrate the kinds of problems that I sort of confront in my analysis of these, this situation, I'm going to provide you with a very brief summary of some of the main events that have occurred over the last 40 years around competition to claim the benefits that will come with being the landowner of the mine that's going to be constructed in the region that I work in. So in the 1980s, a set of individuals from two different language populations assembled together and traveled to court, intent to gain legal recognition of the ownership of the prospect land on the behalf of various landholding groups, or we'll call them clans, whom they, this, the, this set of individuals purport to represent. After several years of grueling litigation, the court awards the requested ownership, but awards it to the name of the village of some, where the, some of the claimants come from, not to any of the landowning groups that they are representing in the first place. Several years later, as the mine nears construction, there is a schism within the plaintiff group. Both rival factions legally register landowner associations, incorporated companies, all purporting to speak on behalf of the previous case winner. Subsequently, the mine developer decides that one of these two associations are the correct representatives of land on interest and awards them a catering contract with the mine exploration camp. So for a brief inventory of the types of social entities that appear in the story, we have individuals, collectively acting set of individuals, customary land holding clans, landowner associations, and ethnolinguistic populations, the mine developer, and of course the courts. There was also a whole range of different actions. Individuals came together and worked together from different um, language groups. Regist uh, there's a registration of landowner association, schisming within these different um, uh, groups. 
uh, the process of awarding land ownership and signing contracts. I also hope you can see how this raises numerous Craig Myers questions. What is the relationship between these different social entities? Particularly, what is the relationship between the group of people, the landowning groups they purport to represent, to whom or whatever the land, um, the court awarded ownership to, and then the later schisming associations? Secondly, how do different acts, like intentionally gathering together for litigation, uh, the judge awarding ownership at court, or the legal registration of association, change, modify, create, or dissolve these different entities or facts about them? While anthropologists have, struck, have, have frequently recounted the kind of uh, sequences of events that I've talked about, as well as unexpected consequences of extractive ministries, they've tr struggled substantially theoretically with to, to what to make sense of the kinds of sequences that I opened with. And so it was my struggles too to answer these kinds of questions that led me to the philosophical literature on social ontology. Today, I'm going to focus on the theoretical underpinnings of two recent monographs on these questions, Alex Golub's Leviathans at the Gold Mine, and, sorry, there's meant to be pictures of the books there, uh, Alex Golub's Leviathans at the Gold Mine and Christina Velka's Enacting the Corporation, and examine the extent that they provide satisfactory theoretical answers to the kinds of questions I opened with. Both works sit within a more expansive literature that draws on performativity theory and applies it to the social entities such as states and corporations. Alex Golub's main focus is on how Leviathans, as he calls in black box entity, are personated by various individuals claiming to act on their behalf, while Welker considers how a mining company is enacted, her word, in the everyday life of, quote, ordinary actors who put the corporations together. The primary source of inspiration for these approaches is Bruno Latour's actor network theory and his particular understanding of late 19th century sociologist Gabriel Tard read through Austin's concept of performative utterances, as well as his particular understanding of the agency of non-human entities. I summarize my sense of Latour's philosophy in a supplementary video for this talk. Before proceeding, a note about terminology. Latour strenuously critiques the very notion of the social, presenting social aggregates, as he calls them, as heterogeneous assemblages of human and non-human entities talking on behalf of or about the purported entity that we call the social in question. But rather than constantly saying aggregates that are often referred to as social, I will, for simplicity's sake, say social entities, while recognizing the tool's skepticism with the coherence of this category. In considering Latour's model, it is useful to distinguish two different sets of questions stressed in recent work in social ontology and examine how Latour appears to answer them. The first is what states of affairs make Latour's aggregates the social entities they appear as? That is to say, when one talks of landowner associations near the mine, how does Latour account for this being the case? The second is what sets up the conditions by which the networks that create the given social entity are able to do so in the first place. That is to say, what determines the conditions for a landowner association existing in the first place? I should say that Latour does not explicitly distinguish these two types of questions, largely providing the same answer for both. I'm going to consider these questions by considering how they work for some of the entities surrounding extractive projects in New Guinea. I'm going to focus on three particular salient entities or properties around mines. The first is uh, the collectively acting set of individuals. In my story, they go to court. We're going to call them Bill's group, uh, the name of one of my informants while in the field. The second is a property of a certain entity or category of persons, which are customary landowners of the mining land. And finally, how landowner association is created. Now, for groups based on face-to-face -face interaction, I find Latour's account fairly reasonable. The extent in which a certain set of individuals, like Bill's group, will be um, considered a group will at least be partially grounded by them repeatedly acting in accordance with a set of expectations of what constitutes being a group, such as gathering together on Sunday, but also people talking about them as such. Like, I don't trust Bill's group. Now, these enactments certainly feed into people's understanding in, in, uh, re mutually recreate uh, people's understanding of what the group is, serving a dual function of both um, constituting the group itself, but also creating the mutual uh, the set of expectations of what uh, being a group involves. Now, 
The tools model, to my mind, begins to run into trouble when considering other types of properties and events. Perhaps the most salient property at stake around attractive industries in Papua New Guinea is the question of who are the customary landowners of the mine? Now, again, numerous factions and individuals constantly complain and act as though they are aggrieved landowners, unrecognized and underappreciated by the state and the mining company. Perhaps the most common conversation I had during my work in the field was, you've been told that they are the real landowners, but let me tell you why we, in fact, are the real landowners of the mine. Likewise, people are constantly debating, arguing, and attempting to decide who, who ought to be considered the landowners. These are certainly performances in the looser English sense of the word, but they are decidedly not elocutions that make them landowners. Rather, much to everyone's frustration, there is one and only one institution that decides whether a given category of person or anything like a village is a customary landowner, the courts. Grounded in the very specific speech act of a particular person, the judge. Now, this doesn't entirely go against Latour's picture and meshes quite easily with the traditional account of speech act theory. That said, Latour does tend to stress constant and repeated performance as the basis for social aggregates, rather than any one specific act. So creating customary landowners in this fashion does seem to grate against his account. It also raises a more fundamental question. Why did the judges' speech acts matter much more than any set of individuals posturing and acting as though they are customary landowners? Here, once again, one might point to the constant references of the importance of courts, um, newspaper clippings, the mining company deferring to them, even the ritualized activity in court that sort of reflects the authority of the judge. And certainly the power is eventually, in some sense, based on the reproduction recognition of state authority more broadly. But the proximate capacity for judges' power for awarding customary ownership is based on various pieces of legislation, such as the Lands Act and the Customs Recognition Act. Now, again, this doesn't entirely go against Latour's picture. Sorry, there's meant to be pictures here. I'm not sure what's um, happened to them. But um, this doesn't entirely go against Latour's picture, um, as the legislation cited here, insofar as it could charitably be considered an object, certainly does alter states of affairs. But it sits awkwardly with many of the examples that Latour and those he inspires like to stress when demonstrating the efficacy of objects, such as um, the, uh, who, which tend to look at the material physicality of objects, such as speed bumps, causally constraining or facilitating human action. To consider another critical entity um, around mining science, uh, a landowner association, and the landowner companies that are meant to rep represent landowner interests. Once again, many people talk about such as associations or on behalf of them. But once again, their authority is grounded in the very particular act of registration and approval by the Investment Promotions Authority. Critically, landowners associations also have all sorts of properties quite detached from anyone acting on behalf of or about them, such as limited liability in a constitution. Compounding problems further, landowners associations can continue to exist without any members whatsoever, as many indeed do in the numerous mines around New Guinea. And once again, this is not based in any constant action or, or causally concerning object, but rather the associations and corporation there. The need for a finer touch. Now, Latour's account is blurredly pluralistic, with a wide range of entities being part of the network that do the work to create other, uh, what he calls social aggregates. Likewise, he includes objects in his picture, and given the dominance of human-centered accounts of the social world, a nod to the importance of non-human objects is useful. Um, similarly, he doesn't merely focus on the psychological states or constituent parts of entities, but rather talk, uh, focuses on practice. However, I find the very broadness of this category creates significant ambiguities in accounts, in his account and those he inspires. First and foremost, he provides few tools beyond gesturing at speech act theory to distinguish what performances matter and why. Many of the properties and entities I've mentioned are detached from the constant uproar of individual actors. Not all human actions are ontologically productive acts, and distinguishing why and how is critical for any satisfactory account of social entities. This is most clearly distinguished by the difference between claimants, uh, the claims to land declaring themselves landowners versus the judge making them so. In this way, the category of um, 
constant work is quite generous, implying that all entities are produced in such fashion. This is how the tools ideas are routinely applied, with anthropologists focusing on how individuals within corporations or ethnic groups enact or personate that entity. As I hope I've shown, this may be the case for certain entities, but certainly not all. Accordingly, what we need is a more precise vocabulary for how different acts create, modify, dissolve, and dissolve social entities, as well as how different social categories are set up. A similar complaint applies to Latour's handling of non-human objects. Again, non-human objects including matter, but in quite distinctive fashions. This is most clearly illustrated by his choice of the kinds of objects that matter, or famously, as I said, speed bumps. They are causally constraining in the sense that they are reason for a person. And when I record on Zoom, I have no pictures, apparently. Um, uh, they are causally constraining in that they might be the reason for a person slowing down, but these are quite distinct from the laws, for example, which are ontologically determining of the various properties of many of the entities considered. Legislation, too, affects states of affairs, but in a quite different manner from material objects. Alternative approaches. I want to finish my talk by briefly going over some alternative approaches in social ontology that I, at least, have found more useful to distinguish the kinds of processes I have studied. This will not be a complete illustration of how one will apply these since time is short, but rather a nod to what I at least see as more promising directions. The first is having the tools to ask the right questions in clearly separating how social categories and kinds are set up and what grounds to specific instantiations of social entities. To this extent, the notion of grounds and Brian Epstein's concept of anchors is extremely illuminating. Unlike Latour's account, the broad category of anchors mean that one can be agnostic about the specific means that social entities are made or modified. Rather than claiming constant work as a generic anchor for most social life and then looking for what that work is, one can instead begin by inquiring what anchors this very specific type of kind. In the case of extractive industries around New Guinea, one must constantly move between grounding and anchoring questions. For example, it is an extremely pertinent question to try and determine the grounds by which an individual counts as a customary landowner with at the present moment. At the same time, the determinants of these very conditions have changed vastly over time, most obviously with the creation of a bureaucratic state, where previously there was none. Once such questions are more clearly delineated, one can begin to establish how different acts may, may ground social entities or even modify the grounding criteria for whole categories. At least in my mind, Speech act theory is often sufficient for a range of face-to-face -face interactions, in which promising, entreating, begging, and bartering provides the ground site for a range of elements of social life, especially in the context of coalition building that constitutes much political competition around extractive industries. At the same time, as the examples of landowner associations illustrate, or the complex ways in which courts misattribute affiliation, mean that face-to-face -face speech acts are not quite sufficient. Rather, more pluralist accounts of how anchors come about are required. In this regard, Barry Smith's notion of speak document acts provide, in my view, a reasonable explanation for at least how some anchors can be produced through human action. Document act here refers to any creation, modification, or destruction of documents, and includes examples like passing legislation, registering association, or dissolving a contract. Critically, document acts can both ground the existence of a certain entity, like my registration of a landowner association, or create anchors for the whole kind of entity, like passing the Association and Corporation Act. Accordingly, one can disentangle complex chain, chains of events, such as censusing a village, registering that village as a party in court, awarding land ownership to that, that party based on previously passed legislation. Conclusions. At the beginning of this presentation, now I have a picture. At the beginning of this presentation, I opened with an example of uh, a story of the kinds of events one is likely to observe near mining projects in Papua New Guinea, like the mining exploration camp pictured in this um, slide here. Individuals came together to work together, forming groups to act on behalf of other social categories, like customary landowners. Courts made confused decisions, awarding land ownership to the names of villages, or factions, schism, and legal registration proliferated. What I hope to have demonstrated today is that one highly influential 
approach to anthropo in anthropology, acting network theory, provides at best a highly ambiguous account of the social ontology behind these processes. Instead, I argue that anthropologists require a finer handle on the different kinds of entities involved in extractive industries and a clearer account of how different social acts create, modify, and dissolve social entities and their properties. The distinctions between grounds and anchors provides a means of discussing these differences, while such uh, notions of document acts help they are move beyond the limitations of the uh, speech act theory to describe how certain actions can provide more durable grounds for a range of legalized entities. These issues are critical for anthropologists working on attractive sites, as in order to provide an adequate account of the political economy of mind, it is necessary for analysts to get the social ontology right in the first place. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hopefully some discussion. <laughs>